Well, shalom everyone and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. This is August the 17th, 2022. And we are excited about all Jehovah is doing in our lives. And welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study, lesson 48 of 52 lessons. So we're almost at the end of this period of study of our Torah. We're in the book of Devarim or Deuteronomy, where Moses is giving his last message, his last teaching to the children of Israel before he goes up to a high place and dies. And so we are excited because we get an opportunity to go over and study what Moses said back then apply it to our lives today and find out everything that we can do to be in right standing with Jehovah Elohim. Remember, sin is any transgression of the Torah. So we want to be in right standing. And so we're going to do our best to learn so that we can do. The more we learn, the more we can do. So we want to get our hearts and minds ready to receive this word. We have some music playing in the background. We don't own the rights to that music. We just use it to get our minds ready to receive all that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will speak to us in our minds as we go through this lesson titled Softim, which means Judges. So listen to the music. We're going to wait on a couple of more people to join us, and then we're going to get started with our lesson, lesson 48. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18 is where this lesson begins. So listen to the music, and we'll wait a couple of minutes for others to join. All those people you see walking by in the background, that's my family. So we got, we're going to have to deal with that for a minute until they get situated, but uh, we should be ready to go. Uh, music has ended, and so we want to cut this phone off and get started with our lesson. Right, that's that. So now we've gotten rid of the music. Phone is shut off, so I won't get a call. And uh, we'll pray and then begin our lesson titled Shock Team. Jehovah Elohim, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to study together, study your word to show ourselves approved. Workmen not ashamed of our higher, rightly dividing the word of truth. We bless you and praise you for this opportunity that we may use this social media to gather ourselves together all over this planet and study your word line upon line and precept upon precept. We welcome the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that comes to guide us into all truth. We open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you will speak to us through your word on tonight. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, I pray. Amen. All right. So now we're going to get ready to get into our shared screen.
and uh, get everything set up. Get our slide presentation ready. And begin. So this is lesson 48 titled Shoftim, Team, S H O F T I M. In Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word that means judges. So we're going to notice that Moses is in his teachings for uh, this particular lesson is going to talk about the structure of this new nation that they're going to cross the Jordan to establish. And he's going to let them know that one of the things you need to do is appoint magistrates or judges or people that will sit at the gate and rule based on the fact that these people understand the Torah. They understand the Torah, which is the foundation for their rulings. And so that's important for us to understand, even as we would start our own community or develop communities, they have to have as their foundation some rules and regulations which authenticate this community or gathering of people that uh, will comprise of families to make up this community. So you have to have some foundational understandings of rules and regulations for how it is to be governed. Uh, of course, in the United States, it is supposed to be the constitution is the guiding force that brings about from 13 colonies into states that would then become what is called later the United States of America. So Moses is laying out for the children of Israel how when they go in and take the land and they establish these cities, this is the order that they should deal with in making sure that they will be successful. Why? Because everything Jehovah sets up is set up for us to succeed as long as we are obedient to what it is uh, we are instructed that we're supposed to do. So a brief introduction, we're gonna talk about shop team or judges, the fundamental issue pertaining to the leadership of the children of Israel. So in other words, these people, uh, remember Moses appointed judges, why? Because that he was making rulings based on the rules or the Ten Commandments and the teachings, the misfortune mis or the rulings that Jehovah was establishing for this nation that was going to be established called Israel. So he's talking about, first of all, get you some judges. And then he, he's already talked, he's going to talk a little bit about kings, which is something they weren't supposed to do. But knowing all, Moses tells them, if you do do this, this is what you should do. And then we have prophets and then priests. Prophets were those who spoke the word of God to the people in terms of teaching and what? Warnings that they were going outside of the rules that Jehovah had established for them and that made with the people in a covenant. So we see then that there should be judges or elders that can rule based on the Torah. Then we, if you do have a king, you, he, he's going to give some specific rules for the king and how the king is to institute Torah. Then the prophets, of course, come along and explain things to the people along with warnings and teachings, reminding the people of these things that they're supposed to be doing. And then, of course, we had the priesthood, who were the basic teachers of all. So the priests were told that they didn't have an inheritance in the land. Their basic responsibility was completely to Jehovah and the study of the Torah. And they, in turn, would then teach the people the Torah. And if there was any ruling that the judges could not figure out what to do, they would then take that ruling to the priests until such time as the king came. So 
Moses tells the people to appoint judges in every city of Israel. So these are fortified cities, and there might be some outlying communities that weren't fortified, but at the gates of the city, because why? At these gates were they attacked, and all of the people would take what they could carry and go into the gates of the city for their security. And so at these gates, excuse me, is where the judges would make these rulings. We also, Moses is going to explain about capital punishment, which was prescribed for idolatry and other practices that are banned by the Torah. Then he lets them know a little bit about the sacrifices, reminding them that they were free of, free of blemish. So you don't bring anything that's not in a pure state to Jehovah for a sacrifice. And that's why it is said that Yeshua was the perfect sacrificial lamb. Then he says that they must follow the rulings of the Sanhedrin or these council of judges that come in and instruct them what it was they were supposed to do. It is even how the system of judging uh, the judicial branch of the Constitution was formed in this country based on taking different concepts of Torah teaching as to what a judge was supposed to be doing. And then it lets us know that it takes two witnesses, not one. There must be two witnesses of the situation in order for capital punishment to take place. And, the, and then he talks about those who might perjure themselves, as we would say, or testify falsely, that they are liable to receive the punishment that they sought to have imposed upon their innocent victim. I think that there's no such thing as pleading the fifth. <laughs> if you know, you're going to have to say. It. And so, If you lied and it was understood that you had lied by the judges, then whatever punishment that was going to give out to that person because of your deception, you then would get that punishment. So I think that you would be a little more careful about perjuring yourself if you knew that if it was found out, you would then get whatever that person was to receive. Then we talk, he talks a little bit about waging battle against an enemy, and they ought to make a peaceful overture. Now, most of the time, this was primarily for the nations around Israel and not for those in the land of Israel. Remember, the borders were going to expand based on the obedience because they would go all the way up to uh, a river. It just escaped my mind just that quick. And all the way all along the Mediterranean Sea, all of, all of that land was promised to Abraham's descendants, but they're going to first show that they could handle that by taking the land of Canaan, which was west of the Jordan. So now let's get into our lesson. Excuse me, beginning in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. You ought to appoint judges and officers for all your gates, and that's in the cities. You're over your El Jehovah, your Elohim is giving you, tribe by tribe, and they are to judge the people with righteous judgment. You are not to distort justice or show favoritism, and you are not to accept a bribe. So the judges were to rule fairly and were not to worry about. If a person was wealthy to try to get them and take their wealth, or if a person was very poor to feel sorry for them, they were to act and show justice in all matters. Why? No bribes for a gift blinds the eye of the wise and twists the words of an even, even the upright. So you don't take bribes from anyone. Justice is to be administered equally, no matter what your status in the community. Justice, only justice, Moses said, you must pursue so that you will live and inherit the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you. You are not to plant any sort of trees as a sacred pole beside the altar of Jehovah your Elohim 
that you will make for yourself. So now here you are, you have the tabernacle and it will be like putting something else and saying that this is valuable to the tabernacle. No, what was in the tabernacle was what Jehovah decided was valuable. And so you don't put anything, you don't add to or take away from the teachings that you had been given. Likewise, do not set up a standing stone. This is a stone carving of some type that is to gather the people around that space. No, you were together. He told you at the gates of the city, or you could go to the uh, tabernacle inside the courtyard or later on the temple. So with that, we've concluded chapter 16. We go to chapter 17. You are not to sacrifice to Jehovah your Elohim, a cow or sheep that has a defect or anything wrong with it. That would be an abomination to Jehovah your Elohim. If there is found among you within any of your gates in any city that Jehovah your Elohim, he keeps reminding them that Jehovah is giving this to them and this is holy land. A man or woman who, who does that, your Elohim sees as wicked transgressing his covenant by going and serving other gods and worshiping them, the sun, the moon, or anything in the sky, something I have forbidden, says Moses, and it is told to you or you hear about it, then you are to investigate the matter diligently. If it is true, make sure, that's why you, because there has to be justice. So you investigate the matter diligently and make sure it's true. And if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done in Israel, then you ought to bring that man or woman who has done this wicked thing to your city gates and stone that man or woman to death. The death sentence is to be carried out only if there was testimony from two or three witnesses. Moses repeats that once again. He may not be sentenced to death on the testimony of only one witness. That means you must investigate some more and see if there's someone else that can help in this matter. If not, then that person cannot be given the death penalty based on only one witness. The witnesses are to be the first to stone him to death. Afterwards, all the people are to stone him. Thus you will put an end to this wickedness among you. Remember, that's for someone who is basically practicing some type of sorcery or worshiping other than the manner in which Jehovah has instructed us we are to worship. And so we go on. I'm sorry. If, verse 8, if a case comes before you at your city gate, which is too difficult for you to judge concerning bloodshed, civil suit, personal injury, or any other controversial issue, you ought to get up, go to the place which Jehovah your Elohim will choose. Now, this will be the place where the tabernacle is standing once they cross over the Jordan, and then later in Jerusalem at the temple, and appear before the who? The priests who are the Levites and judge in the office at that time. Seek their opinion and they will render a verdict for you. And so we see that the Levites then are also judges in the sense that they will interpret for the people how to rule in that matter if the people do not understand. Remember with Moses, whenever the people brought him something he did not understand, he would go into the tent of meeting and ask Jehovah. He didn't make stuff up. He didn't guess. Then he would come out and say, Jehovah says this. And that's why it says you have to go by that ruling because essentially what they're saying is that that ruling came about through the wise counsel of Jehovah, our Elohim. He goes on to say, in accordance with the Torah they teach you, you ought to carry out the judgment they render not turning aside to the right or left from the verdict they declare to you. Anyone presumptuous enough not to pay attention to the priest appointed there to serve Jehovah your Elohim or to the judge, that person must die. Now, if you don't want to abide by that ruling, then you will be put to death. Thus, you will exterminate such wickedness from Israel. All the people will hear about it 
and be afraid to continue acting presumptuously. So you've gone all to this way to find out what the verdict should be in this matter. And now after going through all of that, you still don't agree with what's going on. Jehovah is saying, then that person is basically like reprobate. He's not going to do right. He's not going to abide. So then you take that person out and stone them. And that way, other people will not be so presumptuous or make up their own mind, regardless of the ruling of the judicial body, they won't do that. And so once again, it's justice, justice, justice. Verse 14, when you have entered the land you over your Elohim has given you, have taken possession of it and are living there, you may say, I want to have a king over me like all the other nations around me. In that event, you must appoint as king the one whom Jehovah your Elohim will choose. Now, remember that happened exactly like that, even though they weren't supposed to have a king because the system set up by Jehovah was the best system for the people. Never supposed to have a king. Moses says, you say this, then as you appoint him, listen to Jehovah, and then he's going to give instructions for the king. He must be one of your kinsmen, this king you appoint over you. You are forbidden to appoint a foreigner over you who is not your kinsman. However, he is not to acquire many horses for himself, Solomon or have the people return to Egypt to attain more horses, Solomon, inasmuch as Jehovah told you never to go back that way again. Likewise, he is not to acquire many wives for himself, Solomon, so that his heart will not turn away, and he is not to acquire excessive quantities of silver and gold. Well, actually, Solomon, he just explained everything wrong that Solomon had done. Jehovah gave him a choice, but once he made the choice, he was given instructions. Look at the Torah. Look at what it says about a king. And his father, David, wrote most of the Psalms. So the understanding of the Torah and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David had exhibited that and told him, even before he became king, follow the Torah. If you do that, your kingdom will be successful. If you don't, then you'll have a problem. So all Solomon had to do was go back here and look at this, and he would have realized, I'm not supposed to do those things. Therefore, I am not going to do them. Then we go to verse 18. When he has come to occupy the throne of his kingdom, he is to write a copy of this Torah for himself in a scroll from the one the priests and the Levites used. So he's going to copy one of the scrolls. He is going to copy that himself. And it has to be done, shown back to the priest to make sure that it follows exactly what he has been told to write. He goes on in verse 19. It is to remain with him and he is to read in it every day as long as he lives so that he will learn to fear Jehovah his Elohim and keep all the words of this Torah and these laws and obey them. We're going to find that there were kings who came into power, especially in the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom never had a good king. But in the southern kingdom, we'll find that they didn't even know where the scrolls were. So they didn't do this at all. And this is what was designed by Jehovah to make sure that they would do what? Keep this Torah and these laws and obey them so that he will not think he is better than his kinsmen. So you don't amass wealth. That's not your job to amass wealth. If you do amass, wealth is for the people. And so that he will not turn aside either to the right or to the left from the mitzvah or the commandments. So this is what Jehovah says. Moses tells Moses, Moses says to them, if you want a king, if that's something you decide to think you need, then 
These are the rules for the king. Verse chapter 18. The Kohanim and the Levi, and Levites, and indeed the whole tribe of Levi, is not to have a share or an inheritance with Israel. Instead, their support will come from the food offered by fire to Jehovah and from whatever else becomes his. They will have no inheritance with their brothers because Jehovah is their inheritance. He's repeating again that they are to get the, now they're going to be given land outside of each city for the Levites to grow their food and have animals for sacrifice to make sure that the animals are always there for the sacrificial system. So that there's never no bribery. We'll bring the animals, or you can bring them if that's something you want to do. But even if you don't bring them, we can still offer sacrifices to Jehovah our Elohim. So he says, that verse 3, the Kohen will have the right to receive from the people, from those offering a sacrifice, whether the ox or sheep, the shoulder, jaw, and the stomach. You will also give him the first fruits of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the first of the fleece of your sheep. So all of these were the tithes that were brought to uh, the tabernacle and later to the temple that was to be given to the Levites. And every third year, a complete tithe of a tenth went to the Levites as well. So this was to make certain that they would do what? Not be dependent upon the people other than through the obedience of the people to what Jehovah has said. So there was no bribing these priests. You, you, it wasn't something that you could do. We don't see that in many places. I mean, we have these consuls and everything in, this, in, this, in the church world, but most of them is still whatever the pastor says. And those that are wealthy cho choose to use their wealth to influence the pastor on what he's doing. And so these things were designed by Jehovah to make sure this didn't happen. But we find that when we are disobedient and when, or when we don't know what we're supposed to be doing, then we'll mess up. So when you know more, you do more. For Jehovah your Elohim has chosen him from all your tribes to stand and serve in the name of Jehovah, him and his sons forever. Only the Levites could serve in the temple. If a Levite from one of your towns anywhere in Israel where he is living comes, highly motor. In other words, he is just, I, I feel the need to come and serve at the tabernacle or at the temple. Then he will serve there in the name of Jehovah his Elohim, just like his kinsmen who stand and serve in the presence of Jehovah. So if, this, if he can convince the other Levites that even though uh, David organized that even better so that they would all have turns and things like that. But if one person wanted to just stay there and work and dedicate himself totally to the operating of the temple and the studying of the Torah, then Jehovah says, allow him to do that. Don't forbid him to do that. So then we go on to our next uh, verse, verse 8. Such a Levite will receive the same share they do in addition to what he may receive when, when it says selling his inherited ancestral property. In other words, he's dedicating himself to the temple and saying that my share of the, grant, of the offerings and all of that, I, will now, I don't need that. I'll get it at the temple. So he's going to serve at the temple or the tabernacle. That's where I want to be forever. When you enter the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, you are not to learn how to follow the abominable practices of those nations. He says, don't even inquire. He's already told the people to tear down any, any altars, any shrines, anything, tear them down and destroy them. So now he's saying, don't even concern yourself with following the practices of those nations. There must not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through fire, a diviner, a soothsayer, an enchanter, a sorcerer, a spellcaster, a consulter of ghosts or spirits, or a necromancer. That's kind of like uh, in, the, in the Pharaoh's kingdom, when Moses did a, a wonder, a miracle, then these magicians or these necromancers could, in fact, 
do some of the things that Moses had demonstrated. And they did that because Jehovah once again explained to us that he allows that to happen. For whoever does these things to, is detestable to Jehovah. And because of these abominations, Jehovah your Elohim is driving them out ahead of you. You must be wholehearted with Jehovah your Elohim. So your whole focus is on what Jehovah, who has given you this land, who gives you the rain, who has chosen you for himself, be wholehearted with that. Because if you jump in and out to all different kinds of things, then what you find is Yeshua said what? You're either hot or cold. But if you just look warm, I'll spit you out of my mind. While you're jumping back and forth, you don't know what to believe. Well, you never will understand what to believe if you have that frame of mind. Verse 15, Jehovah will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves. From your own kinsmen, you ought to pay attention to him. This particular section we're getting ready to get into, we're saying that Moses was giving a prophetic utterance of the coming of Yeshua, our Messiah. He goes on to say, you ought to pay attention to him just as when you were assembled at Horeb and requested Jehovah your Elohim, don't let me hear the voice of Jehovah my Elohim anymore, or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I will die. On that occasion, Jehovah said to me, they are right in what they are saying. They were not ready. But in making their pledge to Jehovah, they said, whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do it and we'll learn why later. So therefore, Jehovah saying to them, this is good. So now, Moses, I will teach you and you will teach them. Because they're saying we are not ready. So when that happened, so Moses is saying, now someone is coming from among your own kinsmen. So that's why we believe that Yeshua the Messiah was of the was a Jew and therefore he represented what Moses is prophesying about here verse 18 it says I will raise up for you for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen Ye Jehovah tells Moses I'm gonna send someone and he'll be like you I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I order him. And what did Yeshua say? I only do what I hear the father say do. So Yeshua is confirming the fact that he is Messiah because Moses says that Jehovah told him, I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I ordered him. And so Yeshua utters that phrase, I only do what I hear. Jehovah, my father, say do. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. So you've been given warning if you still don't really understand who Yeshua, our Messiah, is. You're going to be judged on that as well as other things. Let's go on. But if a prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name, which I didn't order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, then that prophet must die. Now, if that prophet is speaking in the name of Baal, or saying, oh, Baal, or whatever he's doing, that prophet must die. But you may be wondering, how are we to know if a word has not been spoken by Jehovah? And then Moses tells them, when a prophet speaks in the name of Jehovah and the prediction does not come true, that is, that word is not fulfilled, then Jehovah did not speak that word. The prophet who said it spoke it presumptuously. You have nothing to fear from him. So it's not that this prophet who believes Jehovah has spoken that to him is to be put to death. No, only if he speaks in the name of a false deity. Then he's to be put to death. But if he's speaking in the name of Jehovah and it doesn't come to pass, then Jehovah is saying he spoke on his own. You don't have to worry about that prophetic word. 
All right, but it's not saying kill everybody who says they prophesy and they do it and it doesn't come to pass. Not saying, saying you spoke of your own. That did not come from me. There's another aspect we have to understand is a prophet can speak the words of Jehovah, but then Jehovah can, in fact, revoke that as he did with Hezekiah because he told Isaiah to go tell Hezekiah that to get his affairs in order because he was going to die. Hezekiah turned and faced the wall and prayed to Jehovah, and Jehovah sent the prophet back. So you go back and tell him that I have extended his days. So it, Isaiah wasn't speaking presumptuously, but Jehovah intervened so that the, his, the catastrophe did not, or his death did not happen. Jonah said that he already he understood that if he goes to Nineveh and tell the people that, he said to Jehovah, I know that you're a merciful God, and they may repent. And if they repent of what they've done, you're going to let them live. And I'd rather not go give them the prophecy so that they didn't have an opportunity to repent and let them all die. <laughs> so then he got mad when he sat there and the people repented. And Jehovah said, okay, your repentance is sincere. I accept it. So Jonah was mad and said, now see, I knew you would do something like that. Beat these people. So they are enemies of Israel. But he wasn't speaking falsely in the name of another God. So we can miss, a prophet can miss it. So what he understands is, if he's a true prophet, what he understands is, I spoke of my own feelings, my own heart, my own mind. And those words were not of Jehovah. So now I got to make sure I don't do that again. So he'll tell you, he's going to get into more study and more conversation with Jehovah. All right. So let's get into chapter 19. Our time is going by. When Jehovah your Elohim cuts off the nations whose land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, and you take their place and settle in their cities and houses, you ought to set aside three cities for yourselves in your land that Jehovah your Elohim is giving you to possess. These are the cities of refuge. Divide the territory of your land, which Jehovah your Elohim is having you inherit, into three parts and prepare the road so that any killer can flee to these cities. The killer who will live if he flees there is someone who has killed his fellow member of the community by mistake who did not hate him or and set out or premeditate to do this to him. So he goes on, an example would be if a man goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood and takes a stroke with the ax to fell a tree, but the head of the ax flies off the handle, hits his neighbor and kills him. Then he is to flee to one of those cities and live there. Otherwise, the next of kin avenger in the heat of his anger, may pursue the killer, overtake him because the distance to the city of refuge is long and strike him dead. So this is, be, is going to keep the kinsmen of Israel, the next of kin, that would also act presumptuously because there hasn't been a judgment yet. So now this person who has done that can go to this city, and once he's inside that city, no harm can come to him, but there is going to be a trial. These cities of refuge are mandated by the Levites who are also judges. So they're going to get into investigating the matter as we will find out as we continue uh, as we go along. Even though he didn't deserve to die inasmuch as he hadn't hated him in the past or it wasn't premeditated, this is why I'm ordering you to set aside for yourself these cities. So he's helping everyone not become a murderer. If Jehovah your Elohim gives you your territory as he swore to your ancestors that he would and gives you all the land he had promised to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, provided you keep and observe all these commands I'm giving you today, loving Jehovah your Elohim and always following his ways, 
Then you ought to add three more cities for yourself besides these three. So remember, he put three on the west side of the Jordan, three on the east side of the Jordan. And if the land expanded, as the land expanded, you were going to add more cities. He goes on. So verse 10, so that innocent blood would not be shed in the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance and thus blood guilt be on you. This is a fascinating thing that as we, especially as African-American people began to learn and understand more um, these things that we are learning concerning being the people of God, then you can understand how murder and the drive-by killings and all of those things are the work of the enemy. They are evil because you're supposed to be able to live comfortably in your community without fear. That's why you they built those walls around those cities so that inside of that, you could live without fear of someone taking your life. Well, in these ghettos and communities that we inhabit, since we don't own the land, we don't own anything about it, then we have to begin to understand these truths so that there can be peace within these communities. And then we can begin to what, set up our own communities whereby we they're owned by us and therefore we can protect ourselves and we have to learn to protect ourselves from one another through the understanding of the truth and the Torah. So it goes on. However, if someone hates his fellow member of the community, lies in wait for him, attacks him, strikes him a death blow, and then flees into one of these cities, then the leaders of his own town ought to send and bring him back from there and hand him over to the next of kin avenger to be put to death. Don't still have to have those witnesses. You are not to pity him. Rather, you must put an end to the shedding of innocent blood in Israel. Then things will go well with you. So if we want to get ourselves into a position of peace in our communities, he's telling you right here, you need to put an end to the shedding of innocent blood. Because as long as you're doing that, the devil is having his way with your community. So he goes on to say, he says, then things will go well with you. You are not to move your neighbor's bounds. So he goes after saying that, he's saying that's how things will go well. When you begin to understand the moral laws of the Torah and practice them. When we begin to do that, then we can bring about a peace in our communities. We can develop communities where peace will abound. He goes on to say now in verse 14, you're not to move your neighbor's boundary marker from the place where people put it long ago. Don't try to go steal somebody else's land. In the inheritance soon to be yours in the land you're over your Elohim is giving you to possess. One witness alone will not be sufficient to convict a person of any offense or sin of any kind. The matter will be established only if there are two or three witnesses testifying against him. Verse 16, if a malicious witness comes forward and gives false testimony against someone, then both the men involved in the controversy are to stand before Jehovah, before the priests and the judges, in office at that time. The judges are to investigate carefully. If they find that the witness is lying and has given false testimony against his brother, you ought to do to him what he intended to do to his brother. He's repeating that again, and Moses is going to continue to do that throughout this whole book of Devarim or Deuteronomy. In this way, you will put an end to such wickedness among, so you won't perjure yourself. You won't do it if you know the penalty for that is going to be investigated by people who are getting after the truth. He says in verse 20, those who remain will hear about it. Be afraid and no longer com commit such wickedness among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So, in many cases, this doesn't mean you cut off a person's hand. What it basically says is there's a value put on that. And so for that, you will have to 
you might have to go into servitude for eight or nine years for that person. You don't know what that's going to be, but those judges are going to point those things out, and that is what you're going to have to adhere to. And if you refuse to adhere to the judgment, then they'll put you to death. Verse chapter 20, when you go out to fight your enemies and see horses, chariots, and a force larger than yours, you are not to be afraid of them because Jehovah your Elohim who brought you up from the land of Egypt is with you. When you are about to go into battle, the priest is to come forward and address the people. He should tell them, listen, Israel, you are about to do battle against your enemies. Don't be faint-hearted or afraid. Don't be alarmed or frightened by them because Jehovah your Elohim is going with you to fight on your behalf against your enemy, enemies and give you victory. And you'll notice is that when the children of Israel were going out to do battle, well, we, what did we see them doing against the Amorites and other people? We saw the priests going with them. So he's going to pronounce a blessing over them before they go into battle and let them know it's going to go well. Now, we saw many of the battles that they went into. The captains came back and said, we did not lose a man. So here's the, we want to give all of this to Jehovah because Jehovah has protected us in this war. And we didn't lose one man. It's part of the spoils that we took. We want to give that back to Jehovah our Elohim. Let's go on to verse, the next verse, five. What's happening to my thing? Uh, there we go. Then the officials will speak to the soldiers. Now, these are the leaders. They ought to say, is there a man here who has built a new house but hasn't dedicated it yet? He should go back home now. Otherwise, he may die fighting and another man will dedicate it. Is there a man here who has planted a vineyard but hasn't yet made use of its fruit? He should go back home. Otherwise, he may die fighting and another man will use it. Is there a man here who is engaged to a woman but hasn't married her yet? He should go back home. Otherwise, he may die fighting and another man will marry her. So he doesn't get a chance to get her pregnant and have descendants. So no first, go to the marriage bed, take care of that. So then he goes on. The officials will then add to what they have said to the soldiers. Is there a man here who is afraid and faint hearted? He should go back home. Otherwise his fear may demoralize his comrades as well. When the officials have finished speaking with the soldiers, commanders are to be appointed to lead the army. When you advance, verse 10, when you advance on a town to attack it, first offer it terms of peace. This was primarily done for land outside of Israel. The land had already been judged inside Canaan. And they, was, they, wasn't going, they weren't going to issue peace offers. They were going to take the city. You can leave, but they weren't going to do that either. So Jehovah said, Kill them all. He says, verse 12, however, if they refuse to make peace with you but prefer to make war against you, you ought to put it under siege. When you hover your Elohim, hand it over to you, you ought to put every male to the sword. However, you ought to take as booty for yourselves, the women, the little ones, the livestock, and everything in the city. All is spoil. Yes, you will feed on your enemy's spoil, which your hover your Elohim has given you. This is what you ought to do to all the towns which are a, at a great distance from you, which are not the towns of these nations. All right, so these people have taken this land from somewhere else, and you're getting ready to take that and annex it to Israel. As for the towns of these peoples, which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, as your inheritance, you are not to allow anything that breathes to live. Well, judgment has already been entered against those people inside the land of Canaan. Rather, you must destroy them completely. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as Jehovah your Elohim has ordered you, so that they won't teach you to follow their abominable practice, which they do for their gods, thus causing you to sin against Jehovah your Elohim. 
when in making war against the town in order to capture it, you lay siege to it for a long time, you are not to destroy its trees, cutting them down with an ax. This is fruit trees, you can eat their fruit, so don't cut them down. After all, are the trees in the field human beings so that you have to besiege them too? However, if you know that certain trees provide no food, you may destroy them and cut them down in order to build siege works against the town making war with you until it falls. So if it's not a fruit tree of any type bearing any kind of fruit, you can cut it down and use it for making ramps and things of that type, that is fine. But fruit trees, you are not to do that. Chapter 21, as we complete our lesson for today. If in the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you to possess a murder victim is found lying in the countryside, and the perpetrator of the murder is not known. Then your leaders and judges are to go out and measure the distance between it and the surrounding towns. After it had been determined which town is the closest, the leaders of that town are to take a young female cow that has never been put to work or yoked for use as a draft animal. The leaders of that town are to bring that heifer down to a body or with a stream in it, a valley with a stream in it that never dries up to a place that is neither plowed nor sown, and they are to break the cow's neck there in the body or that valley. Then the Kohanim, who are Levites, are to approach, are to approach, for Jehovah your Elohim has chosen them to serve and serve him and to pronounce blessings in the name of Jehovah. They will decide the outcome of every dispute in manner involving violence. All the leaders of the town nearest the murder victim are to wash their hands over the cow whose neck was broken in the body. Then they are to speak up and say, this blood was not shed by our hands, nor have we seen who did it. Jehovah, forgive your people Israel, whom you redeem. Do not allow innocent blood to be shed among your people Israel, and they will be forgiven this bloodshed. Thus you will banish the shedding of innocent blood from among you by doing what your oversees as right. That's the most important thing, that last little phrase that we're going to even end on tonight. And that is, this is what your oversees as right. He is the establisher of right and wrong. And so it's what he sees as right. Our interpretation of what he sees is based on the Torah. So that's how our perception is developed as to what is right and what is wrong. It is based on the Torah. If we make up our own system, then that's what we see as right. And what you're doing is pretty much making yourself like a God. So now you have set up your own kingdom. So it's important for us as we're going through this and as Moses is telling them all of these things to <clears throat> allow your hearts to receive these truths so that you can then in fact what? Walk in accordance with these words. Some notes the prophet tells us, the prophet Isaiah told us, you are my witnesses, says Jehovah. We are the witnesses charged with the responsibility to testify and reveal the truth of Jehovah throughout the earth. That's our responsibility as his children. But this is why we need to have some of our own communities so that we can develop these things in the manner in which they were to be established so that people can see what happens when you be obedient to what Jehovah has established for her. We serve as clarifying witnesses when we recognize the presence of Jehovah in the magnificent universe he created. When we remind ourselves and others of the good inherent in the world, and within people. So we're supposed to be doers and not hearers only. Another fact of the study talks about the gates of the city, and we can also relate those gates to the human anatomy. And we talk about the seven gates or the seven portals to the outside world. We have two ears to hear what is being said. I mean, two eyes to see and develop a perception, but our perception should be based on the Torah. We have two ears to hear. Once again, we can hear all sorts of things, but even in our hearing, it must be based on the Torah. We have nostrils to breathe the air that Jehovah has given us and a mouth. And it's a fascinating thing that we should understand that 
as long as we have thoughts, they can belong to us. But once we speak something, then that belongs to everyone who hears it. And they will interpret it in whatever way they would. That's why wise men will say, always say, listen, meditate, and then speak. It is incumbent upon us to place internal judges. That's the law of the Holy Spirit to discriminate and regulate what should be admitted and what should be kept out. It's a clear example of how spirituality makes a difference in the way we act, feel, and think. Believing that there is a God in whose presence, which is what Proverbs tells us, the beginning of all wisdom is the acknowledgement of Jehovah our God, means that we are not the center of our world, Jehovah is. So you're not, you're going to humble yourself. You're not going to walk outside of what Jehovah is instructing you. And so then we'll understand that none of us walks alone. Each carries is the experience of our ancestors, whether he or she roams along with their troubles, their traumas, their victories, their hopes, and their aspirations. Our thoughts grow out, grew from, so in other words, our we have a legacy that has been given to us, and we ought to take that and embellish what we've been given. Uh, one of the words of the seven principles is the Kuumba to be creative and to make our community more beautiful than when we found it. Well, this is what we, we talk about. We're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. Well, we're supposed to learn from what they have done, perceive through the Torah, what was done, and then make this community a more beautiful place than when we found it. So as we stand on their shoulders, that consciousness, that heritage, with all the brothers, our brothers and sisters, then we can begin to develop communities of our own, even in this nation, until Messiah returns. Once Messiah returns, he's going to get everything right and rule with an iron hand. But in the meantime, we need to develop our own communities around these principles so that we can be living epistles, living epistles read of men. With that, that includes our lesson for tonight, lesson 48, Shaftim, which is the judges. So thank you all so much for joining me on tonight. Uh, I had a great time presenting this information. I had a great time studying it. Uh, we'll get together again on Shabbat night for our companion study, which is going to be coming from the book of Isaiah. Uh, we'll get together and go over that word. And once again, uh, study this word together and be blessed by all that the Ruach HaKodesh will speak to our hearts. With that, let us pray. Jehovah our Elohim, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your people who have gathered together in your name to study your word. We thank you that you've given us the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth, opening up our hearts and minds to receive all that you're saying to us and empowering us to be doers and not hearers only. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me. We know that as we study this word together, we are going to be what? We're going to receive the blessings of study. All right, everyone. Shalom. I'll see you for our Shabbat night service, Friday night, 8 o'clock um, Eastern time, 5 o'clock Pacific time. Shalom.